Chapter 3 I woke up early in the afternoon, as usual. I'd gone to bed shortly before dawn, the same time as Mr. Krepsley, but while he had to stay asleep until night came again, I was free to rise around and move around in the daylight world. It was one of the advantages of being only half-vampire. I made a late breakfast of butter on a bagel, even vampires had to eat normal food, blood alone won't keep us going, and plopped down in front of the hotel TV. Mr. Krepsley didn't like hotels. He usually slept out in the open, in an old barn or a ruined building or a large crypt, but I was having no part of that. I told him point blank, after a week of sleeping in the cold, I'd had enough of it. He grumbled a bit, but finally gave in. The last two months had passed pretty quickly because I'd been so busy learning about being a vampire's assistant. Mr. Krepsley wasn't a good teacher and didn't like repeating himself, so I had to pay attention and learn fast. I was really strong now. I could lift huge weights and crush marbles to pieces with my fingers. If I shook hands with a human, I had to be careful not to break the bones in his fingers. I could do chin-ups all night long and throw a baseball further than any grown-up. I measured my throw one day, then checked in a book and discovered I'd set a new world record. I was excited at first, but then I realized I couldn't tell anybody about it. Still, it was nice to know I was a world champion. My fingernails were really thick, and the only way I could cut them down was with my teeth. Clippers and scissors were no good on my new tough nails. They were a pain. I kept ripping my clothes when I was putting them on or taking them off and digging holes in my pockets when I stuck my hands in. We'd covered a lot of distance since that night in the cemetery. First, we'd fled at top vampire speed, me on Mr. Krepsley's back, invisible to human eyes, gliding across the land like a couple of high-speed ghosts. That's called flitting. But flitting is tiring work, so after a couple of nights, we began taking trains and buses. I don't know where Krepsley got the money for our travel and hotels and food. He had no wallet that I could see and no bank cards, but every time he had to pay for something, out came the cash. I hadn't grown fangs. I'd been expecting them to sprout and had been checking my teeth in the mirror every night for three weeks before Mr. Krepsley caught me. What are you doing? He asked. Looking for fangs, I told him. He stared at me for a few seconds, then burst out laughing. We do not grow fangs, you idiot, he roared. But how do we bite people? I asked, confused. We do not, he told me, still laughing. We cut them with our nails and suck the blood out. We only use our teeth in emergencies. So I won't grow fangs? No. Your teeth will be harder than any human's, and you will be able to bite through skin and bone if you wish, but it is messy. Only stupid vampires use their teeth, and stupid vampires tend not to last very long. They get hunted down and killed. I was a little disappointed to hear that. It was one of the things I liked most about those old vampire movies. The vampires looked so cool when they bared their fangs. But after some thought, I decided I was better off without fangs. The fingernails making holes in my clothes were bad enough. I would be in real trouble if my teeth had grown and I'd start cutting chunks out of my cheeks as well. Most of the old vampire stories were untrue. We couldn't change shape or fly. Crosses and holy water didn't hurt us. All garlic did was give us bad breath. Our reflections could be seen in mirrors, and we cast shadows. Some of the myths were true, though. A vampire couldn't be photographed or filmed with a video camera. There's something odd about vampire atoms, which means all that comes out on film is a dark blur. I could still be photographed, but you wouldn't get a clear photo of me, no matter how good the light. Vampires were friendly with rats and bats. We couldn't turn into them, as some books and films said, but they liked us. They knew from the smell of our blood that we were different from humans, and often cuddled up to us while we were sleeping or came around looking for scraps of food. Dogs and cats, for some reason, hated us. Sunlight would kill a vampire, but not quickly. A vampire could walk around during the day if he wrapped up in a lot of clothes. He'd tan really fast and start to go red within 15 minutes. Four or five hours of sunlight would kill him. A stake through the heart would kill us, of course, but so would a bullet or a knife or electricity. We could drown or be crushed to death or catch certain diseases. We were tougher to kill than normal people, but we weren't indestructible. There was more I had to learn, a lot more. Mr. Krepsey said it would take years before I knew everything and was able to function by myself. He said a half-vampire who didn't know what he was doing would be dead within a couple of months, so I had to stick to him like glue, even if I didn't want to. When I finished my bagel, I sat and bit my nails for a few hours. There wasn't anything good on TV, but I didn't want to go outside, not without Mr. Krepsley. We were in a small town, and people made me nervous. I kept expecting them to see through me, to know what I was, and to come after me with stakes. When night came, Mr. Krepsley emerged and rubbed his belly. I'm starving, he said. I know it is early, but let us head out now. I should have taken more than that silly scout man's blood. I think I will track down another human. He looked at me, with one eyebrow raised. Maybe you will join me this time? Maybe, I said, though I knew I wouldn't. It was the one thing I swore I'd never do. 
I might have to drink the blood of animals to stay alive, but I would never feast on one of my own kind, no matter what Mr. Krepsley said, or how much my belly growled. I was half vampire, yes, but I was also half human, and the thought of attacking a living person filled me with horror and disgust.